Hi, this is Bob Bazanko, and this welcome to History 3322, uh, which is a history of the Vietnam War. Uh, we'll be meeting for the next 15 weeks here, Wednesdays from 1 to 4. Um, and it'll be broadcast on Saturday nights from 1 to 3.35 a.m. So I want to say hello to everybody who will be watching Saturday night, too. Uh, I want to start by briefly going over the syllabus, and then we'll kind of hit the ground running. Um, you all have a copy of this, right? I'll just kind of briefly do it. Uh, on the first page is all the vital information, um, office numbers and email addresses and so forth, uh, and a little bit about the webpage, which I'll get to later. Also, I want to introduce behind us James Carter here, who will be the assistant, and he'll be doing the actual grading in this class. So if you're angry and upset, this is the guy you want to uh, target your anger at, not me, because... You know, I would give everybody A's if I could. Um, and James has office hours and email and phone uh, information on that too. And you can read the little blurb on your syllabus, which uh, uh, tells you, um, you know, what the course is about. Now, in addition to that, let me let me go to this now. I've set up a web page, and I'm trying to make it as interactive as possible. And so uh, the address is here, the URL address. It's on the syllabus, and I know you can't read it uh, from that. And you can scroll down and go to the the link that says Vietnam War. And on that, you can find the syllabus, too. And again, it's too small to read, but uh, and, and you can get the information from there. So if you lose one or you know you have some in question and you can't find yours, you can always go to this and get it from there. Okay. Um, the books I brought in, uh, which you should have, uh, are, should be available in the bookstores. Uh, the text, more or less textbook, is going to be Marilyn Young's book, The Vietnam Wars. Um, there's a book of uh, readings that I put together, called Vietnam War. Uh, Vietnam and America readings and documents. This one you're going to have to get at the campus bookstore. It won't be available anywhere else. These other ones you may be able to uh, find elsewhere. Uh, William Dwyer's book about the Vietnamese Sacred War, uh, Masters of War, which is a, a book I wrote about uh, military strategy, and then toward the end a book on MIA POWs, and the final book we'll talk about Vietnam since the American War, 1975 to the present, by Gabriel Coco called Vietnam Anatomy of a Peace, and those should all be available. They're fairly easy to find either in the bookstore here or in a campus bookstore or, or um, I'm sorry, that bookstore in town or on the web or whatever. Um, the grading situation is explained in there. There'll be two tests, one in the middle of the semester, one at the end, and they'll each count for, for half of your grade. There'll be essay tests. And prior to the uh, exam, I'll put some preview questions up um, on the web page and I'll send it via email, which I'll talk about in a second. So when it comes time to take the test, you'll have some sense of uh, what it's going to be about. Okay. Uh, the two things that I want to spend a, a little bit of time here uh, discussing with you are uh, the email discussion list and the web page. Um, we've set up a uh, discussion list for the class so that we can communicate with each other both for information purposes and to discuss um, issues uh, regarding our readings and what's going on in class. And to get to this, um, well first actually, to get to that, you can go to the syllabus uh, cancel. There we go. And scroll down. Uh, you can follow along at home doing this to the email discussion list. And you can uh, just link up from there. And on this page, you'll find a, a listing for History 3322. And you can go to that. Uh, and again, I know you can't see this. Hit join, and, and you'll get on it that way. It's, it's fairly simple. Uh, after that, if you want to get on it, you can just go to the discussion list here and you put in your username, which will be HIST3322. The password is on your syllabus, on your written syllabus that you've gotten. It's, I'm trying to keep this list confined to the class, so uh, you can use the password or if you can't find it, you can give me a call and I'll give it to you. Okay, And you can get on that way. And from here, you can post messages, or you can read messages that have already been posted. Uh, the idea behind this is that, you know, uh, what I plan to do is, is uh, let's say every Sunday, send something out based on that week's readings to all of you. If any of you, have any of you checked onto that yet? Have you gotten anything from it? Uh, you, you should. I mean, this is, this is really important, so make sure you sign up for this as soon as possible. What I'll do is send something out with a couple questions based on that week's readings so we can uh, you know, open class or maybe after the break come back and start talking about that. If you have a quick, yeah. Um, can we use our, uh, our regular ISP email account or we have to use the U of H email account? Uh, you can, I think you can use any email account, but you have to go through this to actually get it and um, subscribe to it. 
But, um, uh, and then, you know, if there's something in the readings that perplexes you or you don't understand or you disagree with or something, you can post it on there. And then everybody will get whatever email is posted. So if I send something out, it's going to go to everybody. And if you reply to it, that'll go to everybody automatically. So your box will uh, have uh, uh, messages from this discussion list on it. And it's a way to pass out information regarding tests or study questions or whatever, speakers, whatnot. But it's also a good way to get discussion going, especially with people at home who aren't here, who can't talk to us you know, in, in live time. So uh, please uh, subscribe to that as soon as possible and check it with some frequency. Um, I hope to, to use this to, to great advantage. Um, and the other thing, of course, as I said, is the, uh, the uh, web page. And um, with regard to that, uh, on the Vietnam page, which is linked, I showed you how earlier, the syllabus is on that. There's a, a whole bunch of related sites. There's all kinds of good sites um, on Vietnam, on the war, on you know, Vietnamese people, the history of the country, the art, you know, a ton of stuff. And I have a bunch of links to various Vietnam pages already up. And if you know of any that aren't there, please tell me and I can link those up. But um, it's fun just to surf, to, to mess around. You can see just all kinds of, of neat stuff on it, a lot, of, a lot of good educational stuff, too. Just an exhaust of a huge amount of material there. Okay, the discussion list we already went over. And the one thing that I hope to make use of is the outlines. And for our purposes, you know, we'll, we'll use those today. Um, for each class, I'm going to put up an outline with some specificity, but not a whole lot of detail. And these outlines will cover um, the main issues we're going to discuss that day. Uh, there will also be links on these outlines to images, maps, sometimes documents. Um, and so you can follow along that way. You know, after class, if you want to go home and go over this, you can basically get the lecture again. Uh, if you're at home, you can boot up before, you know, you put your tape in and, and follow along this way. And um, so I'll be doing that uh, hopefully quite extensively. And again, if you have any ideas about uh, images or links or documents or anything like that, feel free to give them to me, um, you know, and we can use uh, those in the course of, um, of the semester in this class, okay? Uh, there's also something else which is unique to 1999, so if you're watching this later on, it'd be like, you know, Larry King, recorded show, do not call in. Uh, later on in the semester, we're going to have a kind of a Vietnam Memorial Week. They're going to bring a uh, replica of the Vietnam Wall. It's called the Moving Wall onto campus the second week in November. And then we're going to have a symposium where we're going to have speakers come in. George Herring, a very well-known scholar of Vietnam. Uh, Nguyen Khan, who was the president of Vietnam in 1964, three different times. Uh, are going to come in to speak. We're going to have other kinds of panels, and it's free, open to the public, and uh, we'll give you more information about that as the semester progresses. Um, on the syllabus, then, the, the last part is just the topics and readings, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, try to keep up with the readings each week. Do the work before you get here, and please try to come with questions, with ideas, uh, uh, and, and that will make for you know a better interplay. Okay. Um, any questions just on this stuff? Okay, and again, if you can't find your syllabus or there's a problem, just, um, you know, you can get it off the web or whatever. Okay. So I guess we're at the ground running, and I want to start today by going into some background about Vietnam itself. Obviously, the bulk of this class is going to be taken up uh, with talking about the American war in Vietnam. But um, the more I study this and the more I write about it and read about it myself, the more taken I am with the Vietnamese history uh, prior to the American experience there. I think if you study Vietnamese history over the long haul, over millennia, you see so many of the characteristics and traits that are going to become uh, very important later on. And, you know, looking at it in retrospect, you can see why the French and then the Americans even more had so many of the problems they did uh, because Vietnamese history over these millennia really uh, uh, indicate the kind of traits, the kind of characteristics um, that would later cause so many problems for Westerners who try to impose control in that country. Uh, um, things like nationalism and resistance and uh, 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 patriotic pride and, and kind of patience. I mean, all of these things are visible uh, in, in the centuries BC, you know, two millennia before the Americans showed up. So that's what I wanted to do today, go into to some I mean, I'm not a, an expert in the Vietnamese history, I, the, the American War, I'm much more familiar with. Uh, but I want to go into some, you know, uh, specificity, uh, uh, some background on the Vietnamese because I think, you know, that that's really crucial to kind of getting some sense of what happened. So the first week or two, we'll probably be doing a lot of background work. OK. 
okay? Uh, the first thing, in, as with any class, is uh, uh, you want to link up. You can see a map of Vietnam, and um, again, you, you know, you probably won't be able to see it that well. But from time to time, you might want to take a look at this. I mean, geography is important. Vietnam is separated into three different regions. The northernmost region is called Tan Kin, and that tended to be the uh, area that was kind of the most uh, rebellious, the most politically active against the French. And, uh, of course, uh, when the American War comes, this is going to be the capital of the, uh, the, the enemy. The uh, middle region is called Anam, A-N-N-A-M, and again, it has a history of rebellion. Uh, the southernmost region in which the capital city, which was during the war called Saigon and now called Ho Chi Minh City, is located, is called Cochin, China, and, and I'll give you these terms again later. And that area during the French period tended to be the area that was most closely associated with the French, that had the most collaborators, and of course, when the American War uh, is waged, uh, the southern Vietnamese will be on the side of the Americans, the Republic of South Vietnam. So from time to time, just take a look at the map and get some sense of the areas we're talking about. Um, the two major life sources in Vietnam are uh, two major rivers, the Mekong in the south and the Red River in the north. The Mekong uh, begins here and curves all the way up uh, along uh, through Cambodia, along the um, border of Laos, all the way into China. Okay. The Red River is over here, and this uh, uh, goes from Hanoi uh, to the Gulf of Tonkin. And these areas tend to be the uh, areas of agricultural production, especially in the south. The, the Mekong Delta is really the, the rice growing region, so it's really crucial. Uh, the vast majority of population lives in, in the, the Mekong area. About 90% of Vietnamese population during the American War lived on the coastline. I mean, really within 10 miles of the coastline, the interior, the central highlands, and places like that was, was rural and, and, and pretty isolated. Okay, so from time to time, take a look at, at the map. It's fairly useful. All right, so we're going to start by talking about the Vietnamese society, uh, talk a little bit about the background, and whenever you talk about Vietnamese history, you're going to talk about nationalism and resistance, and that's going to be a common thread, which we're going to see time and time and time again. It's really kind of a redundant issue with the Vietnamese. Okay, so we're going to start by talking a little bit about the Vietnamese origins, a little bit about Vietnamese society and culture, Vietnamese resistance to foreign invasion. Uh, by the time the Americans arrive uh, in Vietnam after World War II, the Vietnamese have already fought, you know, over centuries, the Chinese, the Mongols, the French, the Japanese, and so forth. So the Americans tend to be another country in this long list of foreigners who have come in. Uh, but a little bit on, on Vietnam itself. The, the, the origins of Vietnam, Vietnamese history, uh, began in the northern part uh, of Vietnam, the Tonkin area, probably uh, four to 5,000 years ago, in the second or third millennia BC. Um, people speaking uh, languages from South China with the culture of South China moved into Southeast Asia and they began to interact with indigenous peoples in the area that is today northern Vietnam, Khmer peoples and, and different tribal groups and things like that. Um, at that time in the north, the Red River area, the Red River Delta, which I just mentioned, was still underwater. And those areas, as, as the water receded, tended to be swampy. So there wasn't a great deal of population there. So the Chinese coming in tended to uh, quickly uh, make their mark and, and ultimately dominate uh, northern Vietnam. By the 7th century BC, uh, a kingdom emerged called the Kingdom of Van Long, and that's not a term that's terribly crucial to know. And that was ruled by a group called the Hung Kings. From time to time, I'm not sure my handwriting is going to be very legible, but we'll, we'll try. Um, according to the Vietnamese myth, the Vietnamese creation myth uh, occurs uh, around this period. Um, the Hung King. Uh, met and mated with a, a fairy princess. So uh, the Hung King was a dragon. So the, the, the Vietnamese creation myth involves dragons and fairies. And in fact, uh, that's still kind of a, a powerful symbol today. Again, you, you may not be able to tell, but this is a uh, uh, dragon carved columns in Hue, which was for a time the capital of Vietnam. So the symbol of the dragon is still uh, very potent today in, in the Vietnamese. They have a, a real keen sense of history, just as you know, in the United States, you have coins with presidents' names on them or, uh, you know, famous buildings or landmarks or anything like that. The Vietnamese will often invoke their creation myths with things like dragons, and, and we'll see some other stuff, too. Um, so the Vietnamese are descended from dragons and fairies. Uh, the dragon lord of the LAC, L-A-C, was, was kind of the, the founder of Vietnam. 
uh, he fathered over a hundred children with a fairy princess whose name was Ao Ko. And uh, then he returned to sea with half of those children and the fairy princess settled in the Red River Delta in the north with the other half. Okay, so he goes back to the sea. She remains on land. And one of those children became the first hung king, the first king of the Vietnamese people. Uh, eventually, the line reached 18 different hung kings. Okay, so it's a long uh, a dynastic procession. The last hung committed suicide. And this is something you'll see from time to time, too, with the, the Vietnamese rulers in 257 BC. And this led to the creation of a new kingdom, the kingdom of uh, Olac. Okay. Um, one, um, as the dragon lord had protected uh, the Hung king, the Olac were protected by the golden turtle. And there's a, a couple, again, it's a powerful image that's still used today. You see uh, steel bearing turtles are quite common. So I don't know if you can tell, but this is a, a huge terrapin with this huge column of steel on it, indicating the, the strength and power of, uh, of, of the turtle and how it's going to protect uh, the Vietnamese people. And here's another uh, a line of columns, steel bearing turtles. You can see you know, uh, probably a dozen there uh, bearing these huge steel columns. Again, as a symbol of the, the power and the protective uh, uh, capacity of uh, these turtles. So these images are still very powerful in, in Vietnamese society. So the, uh, the golden turtle spirit would protect the Alak kingdom just as the dragons had protected the, the Hung kingdom. They guarded the Olac. Um, eventually, and you can still see these throughout Vietnam today, there are hundreds of shrines and movements dedicated to the dragon, the Hung dynasty, and to the Olac. So it's a very potent legacy, and the Vietnamese are quite aware of, of that. Okay. Um, from the Olac um, in 208 BC, the kingdom of Nam Viet emerged, and this is the origin of the modern Vietnam name. Um, the Nam Viet uh, peoples came out of south coastal China and they conquered the Olac, the, the Turtle Kingdom, uh, uh, in 208 BC. Um, for about a century, for about a century, these, uh, the uh, uh, Nam Viet Kingdom ruled, but then in 111 BC, uh, the Chinese, who had been unified by the Han Dynasty, came in and took control of Nam Viet. And occur again, most of this is occurring in the north. Uh, the south is still not heavily populated, and the south is just too far away. So in the south, you still have indigenous peoples working along the Mekong and so forth. Right? Uh, so uh, the, the Han established Chinese control uh, in the second century BC. Um, almost immediately, however, and this is over 2,000 years ago, the Vietnamese began to resist the Chinese. And this is something you're going to hear time and time and time again. I mean, today we're going to go over this in, in fairly uh, great detail. Uh, Vietnamese resistance is a common thread. It's, it's a common issue. Uh, and you can see this from the very beginning. Um, Chinese administrators in the north, in the Tonkin area, demanded uh, authority and conformity. And they, they challenged Vietnam's own traditions and Vietnam's own uh, sovereignty. And so this is going to be a real issue and it's going to remain one for, for a very long time. Who, who controls Vietnam? Who uh, uh, really maintains Vietnamese sovereignty? Um, and from the beginning, Vietnam begins to develop a series of folk heroes. Uh, the last in the line will be, of course, Ho Chi Minh, somebody you're probably familiar with already. Uh, but among the first were, were actually two women, uh, Trung Trok and her sister Trung Ni, who of course are known as the Trung Sisters. And again, uh, the Trung sisters uh, are still a potent uh, legacy today. Um, again, a photo. There's a procession honoring the Trungs with the, the elephants, and they have a big parade. So again, this is an indication, like the dragon, like the turtle, of how the Vietnamese will invoke their past history uh, for uh, contemporary uh, uh, purposes. Um, the Trung sisters, around 40 AD or so, uh, especially Trung Track, established a rebel army. And around 40 AD, they actually forced the Chinese officials to flee out of Nam Viet back to Canton. All right. uh, then Trung Trac was actually proclaimed the queen of Nam Viet. So this is the first Vietnamese independence movement, and, and it succeeds. Uh, only for a short time, however, within a few years, the Hans put an army together, came back in, and recaptured the Red River Delta. And the Trung sisters both committed suicide. 
again, uh, rather than relinquish national sovereignty, they chose to take their own lives because it was more important uh, to them. And you'll see this time and again, this is, is not un uncommon among uh, Vietnamese uh, uh, dynasties where they will commit suicide rather than turn their country over. So there's already developing in 30, 40 AD this uh, incredible legacy of resistance of a rebellion against foreign oppression. Now, once the Trung sisters commit suicide, the Chinese come back in, and this leads to a, a gradual but uh, fairly steady uh, control or, or growth of Chinese influence called, that's the term, Sinicization. Whenever you see Sino, S-I-N-O, S-I-N is usually the uh, uh, indication that it has something to do with China. So Sinicization means uh, increasing control by the Chinese. And you see that from the first century A.D. onward. So there's going to be this tension, this conflict throughout the next millennia. The Chinese will constantly be trying to gain greater control. The Vietnamese will be negotiating on one hand, but resisting on the other hand. So there's going to be this tension that's going to be calm and constant throughout Vietnamese history. Uh, something else comes out of this, too, that's going to be very important. A new Sino, Chinese, Vietnamese elite is established. And there's always going to be a, sh uh, a kind of a division, a schism, in Vietnamese society between those who have Chinese blood and those who are indigenous Vietnamese. Uh, the elite at this time tends to be Chinese Vietnamese or Chinese. Uh, later on, um, you're going to have all kinds of issues about this with regard to collaboration and so forth. Uh, the Chinese tend to be the merchant class in Vietnam in this period. So uh, you see kind of start to see social divisions. This new Sino-Vietnamese elite is established. Now, a lot of Vietnamese, indigenous Vietnamese especially, uh, don't like that. So revolts against this new elite. It's kind of a nationalist and a class-based revolt at the same time. On one hand, they don't like the fact that the Chinese have come in and imposed their authority on Vietnam against these indigenous people. On the other hand, they resent them because they're wealthier. They tend to control the economy. So it's both kind of nationalist, ethnic in some regard, and, and class-based. Uh, so these kinds of revolts break out with some regularity. And this is something else you're going to see when you study Vietnamese history. Even today, I mean, in 1999, the, the American media doesn't pay a lot of attention to Vietnam, but if you look at sources on the, on the Internet and so forth, uh, this is still happening today. I mean, it's just very, very typical of the Vietnamese peasants, workers, unions, veterans, whatever, uh, to spontaneously have an uprising, to march against corruption, against bureaucracy, for land, for rice, whatever. So again, you see this very early on. Um, so revolts are quite common already in the first century AD. They break out with some regularity. Uh, the Vietnamese never, most Vietnamese, I mean, many did work with the Chinese, but most never acquiesced, never gave in to Chinese control. Right? And you see this pattern recur for the next millennium. I mean, throughout the next 10 centuries, it would be kind of an exhaustive list of rebellions, of spontaneous uprisings, of uh, Vietnamese uh, rebels and patriots who tried to break away, who tried to form a guerrilla army and take on the Chinese, who hassled and harassed the Chinese administrators. So the Chinese never had it easy. I mean, there was kind of a constant need to be vigilant on their part to maintain control of Vietnam. So the Sinicization, I mean, it was successful. Clearly, China controls Vietnam, and a Sino-Vietnamese elite is established. But it was never easy. It was a constant struggle. I mean, never were they able to kind of, you know, force them to submit, uh, you know, compared to something like uh, the U.S. government's attempts to, to crush the Indians, which, you know, by 1890 was successful. I mean, th this was much different than that. Uh, you see this throughout, you know, whenever you see colonization, you tend to see an attempt to crush the aboriginal peoples. Uh, it didn't work here. I mean, the Vietnamese uh, remained uh, steadily vigilant against the Chinese throughout this period. So from the Trung sisters onward, you see this constant series of uh, actions and political organizations and so forth committed to trying to get the Chinese out of, of Vietnam. Okay, so we'll go to the next outline. I have a quick question. Sure. It, it, was there something about um, was there something about Vietnam or the resources in Vietnam or the land of Vietnam or the was there something about Vietnam that or was it just purely land expansion and oh, the, that drove the Chinese the Chinese, push the Chinese um, down? 
I mean, the Chinese are a great empire. I mean, we tend to think of empires, we think of Greece and Rome, but in fact, China, Africans have great empires, even the perceived Western and European empires, too. And I mean, this is part of it. I mean, there's, I think all of that is part of it. Um, there's access to the South China Sea, to the Mekong, to rice growing regions. Um, I know there is just generally this imperialist eth ethos that's forcing them to expand, that, that makes them expand. Um, it's not similar to the European pattern, but at the same time, it's just as impressive in its own way. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think, uh, in terms of resources in the north, um, nothing, you know, really comes to mind. Later on, you're going to have like tin, tungsten, rubber, but that's, you know, off into the future. So I think, you know, in general, it's, it's land expansion, it's control, it's power, it's empire, right? Uh, I mean, it's kind of part of a larger process. Um, you know, look at the United States. I mean, objectively, Puerto Rico and Guam don't have huge, vast resources that the U.S. needs, yet the U.S. took them. So, I mean, sometimes kind of imperialism has its own justification just by being there. You know, you take over other lands and uh, you don't want an enemy on your borders. I and mean, I think that has a lot to do with it. They would, they, the, the Chinese probably would, would see it in, in some large measure as a, as a defensive thing as well. Yeah, but uh, I mean, it was constant too. It was never. I mean, even today, it's not out of the Chinese, you know, mind. I mean, you know, 1979, just 20 years ago, they they were at war against each other. So uh, uh, China and Vietnam, you know, are, are always going to be at loggerheads. Okay. So this cynicization. I mean, you have a question. Push the. So are you saying that that the Chinese <coughs> were targeting the breadbaskets of the Red River and the Mekong? valleys and then w was trade established back through China from those two areas? There, there's some. I don't, I mean, for one thing, uh, if, you know, I, I don't read Vietnamese, so the stuff I've read is in English and there's not a huge, huge literature in English on Vietnamese history. It's hard to get some sense. I don't get the sense that it's really necessary. I think the Chinese are feeding themselves. Um, it's kind of more like, uh, uh, in a sense, it's not unlike what the West always sees Asia as, which is something that has great potential for the future. Um, you know, they're getting some resources out of Vietnam, but m from what I've seen, it's not a great deal. Uh, I mean, the Chinese don't need Vietnam for food or for anything like that. They're, they're doing okay on their own, uh, especially during the Han, which unifies China. It's kind of a, a fairly decent period in Chinese history. So. Um, I think it's more like, you know, to, to maintain security on the border and for future use. Uh, I mean, they're not down in the Mekong yet at all. I mean, you don't see that for a while. Uh, the south, you know, is, uh, you know, I mean, they're gradually moving southward, but at the beginning, it's, it's in the north. It's in Tonkin because there's a border. There's a long border there that they share. Yeah. <coughs> so you see this from the Trunk Sisters onward. Finally, though, um, the Vietnamese gain independence, national independence. And this occurs for the first time in 939 A.D. And um, the Tang Dynasty, which is a, a Chinese dynasty, the Tang, is in disarray at this time. This is the, uh, the 10th century A.D. And so the Vietnamese exploit this, this Tang, this Chinese disarray to gain independence. Right? Uh, and in fact, um, one of the major battles at this time uh, was a sea battle that's, uh, again, commemorated uh, by the Vietnamese. It was called the Battle of Bac Dang against the Chinese in 938. And there's a, a you know, if you get a chance to check, this is really beautiful uh, uh, artwork uh, commemorating the Battle of Bac Dang, uh, which was a major Vietnamese victory uh, just a year before they gained independence uh, by uh, uh, ousting the Tong Empire. Okay? So in 939, for the first time, the Vietnamese have national independence in, in kind of a modern uh, way uh, for the 10th century. Um, this did not immediately bring a golden age, though, uh, to the Vietnamese. Uh, there was no um, monarch able to really unify the country. Uh, so for almost a century, the Vietnamese remained uh, disorganized and not really unified. I mean, there are indigenous peoples in the south, in Cochin, China, in the southern region, and also in Anam. And you're always going to see tensions between those regions. I'm, I'm not even going into detail about the ethnic groups. So that becomes quite complicated. I mean, you have Hmong and Khmer. A Khmer kind of have a Cambodian origin to them. I mean, there's many, many different ethnic groups who have their own ethnic and tribal divisions. And so uh, Vietnam is not a unified country. I mean, to speak of it as, you know, it's a country in the sense that it's Vietnam, but in terms of it being a nation with people who identify uh, in a similar way, that's, that's not the case. 
So you really have major differences between the North and the South. Uh, the North, because it's so used to the Chinese, is always going to hate them more. They're, they have a, a closer relationship with them. And it's going to be that way then throughout the, the next millennia. So it's very difficult to unify uh, Vietnam uh, after 939. That finally occurs, though, in about another century when in, in 1009 AD, and, and the dates aren't, you know, you don't have to know the precise dates of all this. It could get uh, quite confusing. But in 1009, the Li dynasty was established. That's L-Y. Later on, there's going to be a Li dynasty, L-E. Okay, so, and, and I forgive you if you speak Vietnamese for my pronunciations of some of this stuff because it's going to be pretty bad. Okay. But in 1009 AD, the Li dynasty was established, and they ruled for about the next two centuries or so. Um, the Li's moved the capital uh, to Hanoi. Uh, actually, the name Hanoi comes from the dragon. It means ascending dragon. So again, even the capital city's name is an attempt, like Washington, D.C., or you know, like naming your state capital after a a president or something like that. Uh, the capital city, Hanoi, is an attempt to call upon this uh, Vietnamese tradition, this Vietnamese past, to the, the dragon uh, uh, creation myth. Okay? Um, so the Lees move the capital uh, to Hanoi. Um, the Lee kings uh, were all tattooed uh, with dragons. They, they bore really elaborate and beautiful. I couldn't find any, unfortunately. I, it would be great. I've seen them in hard copy pictures, which I couldn't even find to scan in. Uh, elaborate dragon, very beautiful dragon tattoos, so that they too could claim kind of the spiritual procession of the dragon lord and of the Hung kings. Okay? Um, and again, this speaks to the Vietnamese use of history. Uh, uh, history is, is inherently... Uh, educational and political. And the Vietnamese are really masterful at this. They have a, a strong sense of their heritage and of their past, this heritage, this tradition of resistance, of, of nationalism, and so forth. And so by calling on the, the, the dragon uh, a protector or the turtle protector, by uh, uh, assuming the mantle of the Hung kings with the dragon tattoos, they're able to kind of link back to that. And so you see this progression through the the, uh, the, the Trung sisters. There's actually another woman who led a rebellion in the second century named Lady True, T-R-I-E-U. So women are actually quite involved in this too. Traditional Vietnamese society actually has fairly similar gender roles, Confucian society to the West where women have a, a subordinate position, but it wasn't at all unusual for women to be political. And so you have the Trung sisters and Lady True who lead rebellions and there were shrines and memorials and artwork dedicated to them as well. So the, the Vietnamese really... Uh, 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 take history and they use it for contemporary purposes. And you see this, I mean, even today. Uh, in fact, there was a, a story that came out today. I guess Time Magazine has a little blurb on Ho Chi Minh. And the Vietnamese government is, a, is, is very upset about it because it's showing some stuff about Ho in a different light that they like. So the Vietnamese are still very conscious, and every society is, of the way they use history. Uh, George Orwell once said, whoever controls the past controls the, basically controls the present and thus the future. If you can tell people how to think about their past and what icons and myths and images they should revere, then you are able to get them to think a particular way at the present. And the Vietnamese are quite aware of that. So they call on this, you know, a, a very uh, heroic and, and, and in many ways quite impressive uh, past with the, the resistance and the, the great uh, dynasties. And they use that for purposes uh, of protest, of dissent, of rebellion, of resistance throughout this, this entire period. Um, so during this period, the Lees quite often invoke the past. Much of the Lees dynasty's authority, however, um, was rested upon the, the moral force they had. Uh, and they often called on the spirits of the past, again, invoking, invoking their heritage. Uh, they often invoke cultural heroes to, to give legitimacy uh, to their rule. So you see the uh, Vietnamese will invoke the dragon kings or the turtle protector just as in America or in Texas they would say remember the Alamo or the way some politicians, Bill Clinton would invoke JFK or the way some people would invoke Ronald Reagan. The Vietnamese will do that too. So they're going to try to gain credibility and legitimacy from invoking um, uh, the past that way. Also under the Lee you see two um, traits that are going to be common to Vietnamese society, Confucianism and Buddhism. And these flourish in the Li dynasty from about 1000 AD on. 
Uh, Buddhism, of course, the religion which is still uh, the major religion in Vietnam. Uh, again, uh, there's a, a Buddhist uh, a pagoda. Uh, there are also uh, statues of Buddha throughout Vietnam. So again, this is a, a rich cultural legacy. Uh, when we get to the American period, this is going to be particularly important. Uh, because a great crisis will emerge in the early 1960s between the Buddhists and the ruling government, which is Catholic. And this is going to be one of the major uh, developments in the uh, ultimate American takeover of the war there. So uh, uh, the importance of Buddhism in Vietnam really can't be understated. It's, it's really crucial to understanding Vietnamese society, Vietnamese history. So Buddhism comes in and really flourishes. It becomes not, not necessarily an, it's not an official state religion, but clearly becomes the dominant religion uh, by this time. There are also kind of uh, a lot of little, uh, what in the West you might call sect religions, although that often has pejorative meanings, which really aren't, aren't uh, the case in this, in this instance. In Vietnam, there are a lot of small religions and uh, uh, groups like that, uh, animists, people who worship nature and whatnot. But by far, the majority is going to be Buddhist and, and, and still is today. And in fact, the Vietnamese government in the 1990s still has problems with Buddhists. They are not only a religious group, but a political force. Uh, and especially so in the 1960s, we'll see that time and again. It's uh, the Buddhists' uh, uh, anti-government activities, uh, which you know, are pretty legitimate in many cases, a constant headache. Uh, for American policymakers, because they're trying to create this image of a stable and secure and progressive and modernizing Vietnam at the same time that this minority Catholic government has majority Buddhists out in the street protesting, and in some cases, you know, you've probably seen the photo burning themselves up in the, in the middle of Main Street. So uh, uh, Buddhism is quite important, and you start to see this in the Li Dynasty. In addition to that, the Chinese adopt a, a Confucian system, and they'll they'll maintain that for about the next. Uh, um, century as well. Confucianism, you've probably studied it before, had it in some class. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It's a, it's, it's a, a philosophy both of, of the self and of the government which calls uh, the subjects, the, the citizens or the individual or the family member to respect tradition, to uh, respect authority, defer to authority. Uh, Confucianism believes there's a natural order to things. Uh, individuals, you know, children respect their parents. Uh, citizens, subjects respect the monarch and so forth. So there's a natural order. In addition to that, Confucianism establishes a system of government um, which is going to be based on merit and skill rather than on uh, bloodlines or, you know, on genealogy. So they establish an elaborate examination system. And again, you've, you've probably heard, you know, you know, you know something about this. So if you want to become a, a civil administrator in the Confucian system in China or eventually in Vietnam, you have to take a test. So they have these elaborate exam systems. So if you want to become a, a civil servant, you take the exam. And if you pass, then you can get a posting. Allegedly, this is a way to have a, a legitimate merit system. So the best and the brightest actually do rise uh, uh, to the top. Okay? Uh, and the Vietnamese, uh, according to these Confucian ideas, establish a national examination system of their own uh, in the uh, period of the, the Li dynasty. Okay? So it's becoming kind of a, a modern Asian nation at the time. And this is really, you know, uh, after uh, the millennia of, of Chinese interference, of Chinese control, this is really kind of a, a golden period for the Vietnamese, the, the Li dynasty. Uh, and that lasts for a couple centuries until around uh, the, the date that they give for the, the end of the Li dynasty is 1225 AD. And at that point, the Li were succeeded by the Tran dynasty, T-R-A-N. Um, and the Tran continued many of the reforms and the developments that had begun during the Li period. Um, the Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese uh, population, Vietnamese territory continued to grow. Uh, the army grew. They start to develop a national army as a way to protect themselves because, of course, the threat uh, from the north is always there. I mean, the Chinese haven't given up uh, by any means on, on Vietnam, so the, you have to protect yourself. You have to prepare for that. Um, the bureaucracy grew according to the, the examination system. You develop a civil bureaucracy to run things, to administer society, so the bureaucracy grows. Uh, the exam system was further developed because you need it for the, for the uh, uh, um, bureaucracy. So this is, in a sense, is modernization 10th or 11th century style. 
uh, in the 20th century, there was always a big movement for modernization of the third world, which often was kind of a kind of a, a, a hidden way to talk about westernization. But this is, in a sense, modernization Asian style, 12th century style, where the Vietnamese uh, are looking to China. Uh, and be, they're still a Sino-Vietnamese elite. I mean, the Chinese, just because they no longer control, still have strong influence in Vietnam. It's cultural control, it's social uh, influence, and things like that. So there's kind of a, a modernization movement trying to be, you know, kind of with these Confucian principles, they're, they're more like the Chinese. But at the same time, they don't like the Chinese. So, you know, you're borrowing and you're part of it, but at the same time, you're rebelling against it. So the, the Vietnamese will always kind of have that double, double issue going. Um, so the Tron kings continue the development of the Li, but at the same time, they have to spend a lot of energy, a lot of resources in fighting off the Chinese, which is why they needed a big army, as I said. Um, the Chinese from the north, in fact, in the, in the 13th century, in the late 13th century, Mongol armies uh, invaded um, uh, from China. They invade Vietnam, and there they were defeated by uh, the forces of, of uh, another Vietnamese patriot, Trung. Let me see if I spelled that. Hung. Trung Hung, H U N G, Dao. Uh, and Trung Hung Dao follows in this line, you know, like the Trung sisters or Lady True or later on Ho Chi Minh. Uh, Trung Hung Dao uh, leads this army in uh, 1284 AD against the Mongols. Uh, he was uh, one of the first in this long line of Vietnamese heroes, like Ho Chi Minh later on who uh, uh, has a, a brilliant strategic mind. And this is one thing that when you study these Vietnamese uh, uh, statesmen and generals, it's just amazing that their, their strategic uh, uh, you know, analysis and their kind of foresight, their patience, which is truly remarkable, uh, really impresses you. I mean, they're able to kind of see the bigger picture, use international events, uh, figure out, you know, uh, maybe you know retreating now means that later on we can do something like that. So there's a, a you know really impressive strategic legacy here as well. Uh, Tran Hung Dao also uh, invoked the nationalist spirit, uh, called on the Vietnamese uh, to you know kind of be patriotic to repel this foreign invasions. He uh, he said that the Mongols uh, uh, ambassadors stroll about in our streets with conceit using their owls and crows' tongues to abuse our court, flexing their goats' and dogs' bodies to threaten our ministers. They've extracted the silver and gold from our limited treasuries. So again, he's invoking this nationalist idea. They're, they're kind of you know, pompous, you know, kind of uh, strutting around as if they run the place, and they're ripping us off. They're, they're emptying you know, the silver and gold from our treasuries, which don't have enough to begin with. And so this works. It's a, it's a strong nationalist message. Uh, the army responds to it, and um, the uh, uh, Tron uh, oust the Mongols. I mean, the Mongols, you know, are a huge invading army, incredibly impressive military force, yet the Vietnamese defeat them. So this is truly, you know, a remarkable, uh, and, and it's based not on sheer force, but on morale as much as anything. And it's another thing you'll see in the Vietnamese wars. Uh, uh, Napoleon once sat in warfare. Uh, morale is about 90% of the battle. And if you study the Vietnamese, you, you kind of believe that because they're never going to be the dominant military force. They're never going to have as much weaponry, as much firepower, but their morale, their will to win is always going to impress people. It impresses the French and the Americans. I mean, Americans, you know, uh, to this day remark upon that. Uh, they give different reasons for it, but the, the Vietnamese will, Vietnamese morale always remain fairly high. So uh, once the Mongols are repelled in this Tron dynasty, the Confucian and Buddhist ideals uh, grow even further. Uh, and Vietnam was relatively stable for a while through the, the 12th and 13th centuries, but um, into the 14th century. But by the 15th century, uh, troubles arise again. Um, there are economic crises which lead to peasant revolts and peasant uprisings. And again, this is something you'll see time and again. Uh, one reason I want to do this background is because it's really remarkable how salient, how important a lot of these characteristics that you see so early on are, because they remain. I mean, they're still around. 
uh, peasant revolts. You see these, you know, from the, the first few centuries A.D., but you see them again in the 15th century. This becomes a major issue. Uh, uh, even though Confucianism says that you should respect civil authority, you should be submissive and deferential, uh, the Vietnamese are constantly, spontaneously complaining. I mean, it's not at all unusual for Vietnamese peasants to march as a group en masse to the uh, civil administrator, to the village chieftain, to the, the local court, uh, whatever. And this often happens throughout the whole country. So you start to see this, and this is often a case, uh, a, a cause of great social unrest. I mean, you know, again, in the 1990s, this stuff is still going on. So there's this real history of revolt, uh, of peasant revolt, of spontaneous revolt, spontaneous uprisings. And again, this is a foreshadowing. I mean, you're going to see this time and again in the 1930s, in the 1940s, especially throughout the entire French period. The Vietnamese are always going to be doing this. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. Um, so you start to see that in the 15th century, the people revolting against the, the uh, uh, Tron dynasty. And uh, finally, a court counselor actually seized the throne, but he was quite unpopular. So in 1407, the Chinese actually came back in and established rule. But this was fairly short-lived. Um, many of the uh, dynastic administrators were closely regulating the village government. They were asserting their control over religious ceremonies, over hairstyles, over the way people dressed, over literature. Uh, nearly everything of cultural, economic, or political significance in this very short period was further Sinicized. So the Chinese come in around 1407 and in 20 years basically try to, you know, make Vietnam more Chinese. And of course the Vietnamese hate this even though they too are Confucian and they have the, you know, the exam system and so forth. They really, they really hate this. So this time Chinese rule was short-lived. In 1428, the Li dynasty led by Li Loi was, was established. Okay? Uh, the Li dynasty, however, was not terribly strong. I mean, the, the first Li dynasty, the Tron dynasty, actually tended to be more, more uh, progressive or more successful than this Li dynasty led by Li Loi. It did not remain strong. There are few heroes from this Li period, which goes from the 14th through the 7th, uh, I'm sorry, 15th through the 18th century to the 18th century. Uh, there are few heroes, few, few national heroes, few myths, few, few kind of elements of folk lore, little great literature, uh, not a huge amount of cultural innovations uh, in these three centuries that the uh, uh, Li Loi dynasty um, is in, in control. There is a, a general state of decline in this period, not unlike the previous three or four centuries with the, the Li and the, and the Tron. Uh, and in fact, the later years of the Li Loi, the second Li dynasty, were dominated uh, by uh, one of the great rebellions in Vietnamese history, the, the Tai San uh, Rebellion. Um, the Taishan Rebellion began, again, as a peasant rebellion against the crown, against Li Loi, against the, the Li dynasty, I'm sorry. Um, by 1786, late 18th century, very shortly after the, United States, the Americans, the United States has its own war of independence. Uh, by 1786, rebel leaders, these Taishan, control basically all of Vietnam. So this rebel band is in charge. They've, they've kind of had this, this revolution, this rebellion within the country. Um, they try to undo Chinese influence. It's a peasant-based rebellion, so there's a class element to it, and there's also a, a kind of an ethnic nationalist uh, element to it, too. There's, they're very proud of being Vietnamese. So they, they replace the Chinese script with um, uh, a Vietnamese writing script called NOM, N-O-M. Um, they replace Chinese as the official writing system. Uh, the Trung sisters and Lady True and old heroes like that are brought back in as, as symbols, as icons of Vietnam's nationalist past. They're really heroes. Um, and so uh, um, the Tai San uh, really, you know, kind of uh, uh, grab the attention. They're quite popular uh, inside Vietnam. They're recalling this great traditional, this, this heroic past. Uh, they're telling the, the people that, you know, you're Vietnamese, you don't have to be Chinese. You know, China's not superior to us. We have our own writing system. We have our own culture. We have our own heroes. We don't need to be more Chinese. We can be Vietnamese and be proud of it. Uh, 
Okay? So the Taishan uh, really control all of Vietnam. Now the Chinese decide to try to exploit this schism in Vietnamese society because the Li dynasty isn't given up power. So you have the Taishan Rebellion, which essentially controls everything. The Li dynasty, which has power more or less you know, in name, but not in reality. So the Chinese come in and try to exploit that um, by trying to re-enter Vietnam. And this leads to uh, what I call the first Tet Offensive in 1788. Uh, you know, we'll talk later on. You've probably heard of the Tet Offensive of 1968. But uh, on the third night of Tet, Tet, which is the big lunar new year uh, throughout Asia, in 1788, um, the Emperor Quang Trung, who was the head of the Tai San, Um, moved on to Hanoi, drove on to Hanoi uh, with a brigade of elephants. Uh, the Taishan, as I said, were a peasant group, and they were uh, trying to eliminate these Chinese forces who had come in under the uh, leadership of uh, Sun Shir Yi, the emperor at the time. And um, the Chinese had come into northern Vietnam just, just weeks earlier. They'd only been there a short time. Uh, the Chinese weren't expecting Quang Trung's army. Uh, Quang Trung, the Vietnamese had the element of surprise. They shocked uh, the Chinese. The Chinese panicked as they fled across the Red River. A bridge broke. Hundreds of Chinese soldiers and elephants uh, crashed into the water and drowned. Uh, a huge number of, of the uh, Sun Shir Yi's army uh, drowned. Uh, shortly thereafter, the, the uh, Qing dynasty, the Chinese dynasty, uh, basically surrendered. They gave up. They recognized Quang Trung's state. Uh, and they withdrew from Vietnam. The Tai San uh, had ousted the Chinese, and the Tai San basically, you know, had again gained Vietnamese independence. So one would think that the Tai San would be basically running things. Quang Trung had uh, led this movement, which took over the entire country. Um, he had eliminated the, the Chinese threat again, uh, and, you know, seemed to have control over everything. Uh, however, that didn't last long. Um, in fact, just you know, about 20 some, less than 25 years later, uh, the Taishan Rebellion, and, and this occurs actually during the, the Lee Dynasty. There's not a, a Taishan Dynasty or anything like that. But the Taishan really don't have uh, a lasting control in Vietnam. Following the Taishan in 1802, the Nguyen Dynasty comes into power and takes over. And basically, the Nguyen Dynasty was a, a backlash, a reaction against the Taishan. The link there is just for a, a, a page that has some information on the Taishan if you're in, interested in that. It's not, no images or anything like that. Um, the Nguyen dynasty, which comes to power in around 1802, uh, is a reaction against the Taishan. Uh, one of the first things the Nguyen do, in fact, is uh, remove the capital from Hanoi, which is up in the north, and again, check the map, to Hue, which is in the uh, uh, Central region, okay, um, and you can you can go to the map and check that out. Uh, so the Nguyen uh, again are trying to create their own history. They're trying to remove Hanoi with the the kind of uh, connection to the dragon, uh, and they create their own capital in Hue. Um, the Nguyen overturn a lot of the Tai San reforms, which are peasant oriented. So again, there's this class element to it. The Tai San represented the peasants, the poor. Uh, indigenous peoples. The Nguyen tend to be typical monarchy representing the elite, uh, tending to have more of a Chinese influence. Uh, the Nguyen believed that the Tai San were decadent. They weren't fit for political rule. They weren't fit really for political participation. They were peasants. You know, it's kind of like the whole imagery which you get in any society of, you know, you, you know there are people who <coughs> are wiser and just, you know, inherently bred to rule. I mean, Hamilton believed this. Thomas Jefferson believed this. John Adams believed this in the United States. You know, Jefferson called the working class a swinish multitude. So this is a, what the New England, this is typical of 17th, 18th century uh, uh, elites. They are educated. They are intelligent. They are fit to rule by birth. And so you have these raggedy peasants out there. You know, you can't stand that. So the Nguyen believed that the Taishan were decadent and disorganized. So they want to return to kind of a more Chinese system, a Neo-Confucian system. Um, under the Nguyen, then, you start to see uh, Vietnam take on the, the form that it will maintain really until the 20th century uh, when the uh, 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 wars of national liberation begin. The Nguyen is a short-lived dynasty. 
Uh, we'll get to the European uh, part soon. Um, they only last, you know, about a half a century. Okay, uh, but the Nguyen are, are the last Vietnamese dynasty in in, in many ways. Uh, after the Nguyen, the Westerners come in, and Vietnam has this series of rebellions and uprisings and wars and so forth. Okay, anybody have any questions on on that? That kind of gets us up to the French period. Yeah, um, I'll push the the speaker thing. At what point? Uh, where is the earliest um, uh, connection between the West and the East in Vietnam? N not in terms of colonial yeah, expansion, I'm actually but talk about that. You, you see it around the 15th century, and it's actually uh, Portuguese. This is clearly trade. Uh, it's the Marco Polo, you know, kind of uh, rebound, where after Marco Polo travels to Asia and you know comes back with these spices and gold and all this other stuff, silk. Uh, uh, everybody, th you know, in Europe thinks that, you know, it's all over Asia. So you start to see that around the, f the 15th, 16th century is the first time that the Europeans actually uh, make their way uh, uh, to Vietnam. And, and actually, I'm going to do a little bit more with that um, shortly. Yeah. Anything else on this? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I want to um, just do a little bit on, on kind of Vietnamese society, Vietnamese values. I mean, you could spend way, way, way lots of time on this. But again, I'm doing this just in brief to kind of give some sense of, of how the Vietnamese uh, uh, understand their history and how these values, which are really long term, um, uh, are important in trying to understand the 20th century, the French period, the American period, and so forth. Okay? Vietnamese values, as I said, were a merger of Confucian and Buddhist ideas and also Taoist ideas. You've probably <coughs> excuse me, heard of Taoism, Lao Tse, and... Uh, Sun Tzu and things like that. So there's this heritage there. Uh, again, not at all untypical of, of Asia uh, uh, throughout these uh, millennia where Buddhism and Confucianism and Taoism kind of tend to merge and create a national heritage. Okay? Uh, and these create Vietnamese values. Now Vietnamese values, Vietnamese culture tend to be different than Western culture, no question about that. But also, and this is really a problem for the Westerners, they tend to ignore or dismiss or misunderstand the Vietnamese culture, these Vietnamese values, these Vietnamese traits. The French don't really care or they don't get it. And the same can be said of the Americans in the US period. There's really no attempt made to understand the Vietnamese. There's a, a wonderful book on that written in the early 1970s by Francis Fitzgerald called Fire in the Lake, who had studied with a French anthropologist named Paul Mousse, M-U-S. And they went on at length about this. And this is a common thread you'll see when you, whenever you read about Vietnam, this kind of sense that they didn't understand what they were doing. The Americans are fighting kind of the way Americans do in, in the West. And the Vietnamese just had a different set of values, a totally different uh, approach to, to national liberation, to war, and so forth. So um, again, I just want to kind of go over some of the major aspects of this, you know, very superficially, unfortunately. Uh, one of the first... Uh, and, and more important uh, aspects of Vietnamese society is, is the use of reason, rationality, which the Vietnamese call li, L-Y. Um, but they do it differently than in the West, whereas in the West we would think reason is a product of the Enlightenment, means that you think things through, you use the scientific method and so forth. Reason, uh, li, is conformity to principles which guide the universe. Okay? And it's, it's sort of confusion. Uh, you have these overriding structures and you have to conform to them. So every relationship then has a proper form. Uh, father and son, brother to brother, subject to monarch. All of these relationships have forms. And um, this sense of reason of Lee rationalizes and legitimizes the hierarchical order in society. So it's, it's Confucian. You know, we defer, we respect this natural order. It's just natural that some people are powerful and high and mighty and others aren't, okay? Another value is family, or to be more specific, filial piety and moral debt. Uh, you're supposed to obey and honor your family. Your parents, you know, are responsible for you and they deserve to be honored and obeyed. They des you have a debt to them. You're in debt to them. Uh, they've given you birth. They've, they've given you life. Um, you always have to try to please your parents and you know on a larger scale you should try to please those people 
uh, who uh, are in charge. And again, this, this seems kind of confusing and, and, and at times contradictory because at the same time they have this sense of Confucian deference and, and family and moral debt and piety and so forth. They're, they're rebelling every week against, you know, whoever's in charge. So, you know, this, not all of it is terribly consistent and sometimes it may seem confusing, but in fact these are all aspects and, and it makes I mean, Vietnamese society you know, quite compelling, but also very difficult to understand. And as I said, the French and the Americans just never got it. Another very important trait is something called nya, uh, which is righteousness, or the righteous path. Um, nya means that you are willing to fulfill your social obligations, basically to do the right thing. You live by an unbending set of rules, um, and again, like these other things, uh, this sets the form for your relationships, for father, son, brother to brother, subject to king or whatever. You do the right thing. You have righteousness. The Vietnamese also believe, and I mentioned this before, in a natural order. They believe that there is a moral and just order in the universe. There are cause and effect relationships between acting virtuously and having good luck. If you behave if you act virtuously, if you have, you know, if, if you act according to reason, if you take care of your parents, if you're a good subject, then good things will happen to you. If you wait, if things look bad, then you wait and the natural order will return. And this is really crucial because this gives the Vietnamese a sense of time that's much, much, much different than the West. I mean, you know, here in the West, this is, this is a baby country, the United States. You know, 1776 is the, the independence date, right? I mean, that's, that's less than 225 years. The Vietnamese, we're talking about millennia, four, five, six thousand years. So the Vietnamese sense of time is quite different. This idea that there's a natural order and things will return to their natural order uh, gives them a sense of patience and vigilance and dedication that the West doesn't really have. I mean, in the West, uh, things tend to be done quickly. And when the Americans go to war in Vietnam, I mean, you know, it's, this is obvious, obviously going to be a huge, huge difference. I mean, the Vietnamese are fighting something called protracted war. We take our time. You know, we'll fight. You know, Ho Chi Minh would often say, I'm willing to fight 20, 40 more years if I have to. So the Vietnamese have a sense of time, a sense of, of patience, much different than the West's. And in, in large part, this comes from this belief in a natural order. I mean, in time, things, you know, we got rid of the Chinese, we got rid of the Mongols, we'll, we'll do it again, but, you know, it's going to happen. We have to act virtuously, and then the natural order will be restored. I mean, clearly, outside forces can come in and disrupt that order. The Chinese can, the French can, or whoever, but it will be restored in time. So they have a belief in this. A um, couple other traits that are really important, and again, uh, when you start looking at the war, uh, uh, they're worth keeping in the back of your mind, of the village and subsistence economy. Um, Vietnam was often called a people's war, and in large measure that's because the composition, the setup, the establishment of Vietnamese society has, you know, kind of localized roots. It's, it's a fairly uh, intimate uh, society in many ways, especially at the village level. Um, the village, and, and indeed the nation, are actually uh, something akin to large families. So you have this family relationship in your own family, father, son, and so forth. But the village is like a family too, and the family is a small village. Uh, villages are fairly isolated. They're separated from one another by rice paddies, by gates sometimes. They're garrisoned. Um, each village has its own guardian spirits. So each village has its own, you know, altars. Um, the, the families live there, they have farms, they have uh, uh, altars, museums, social clubs, organizations, burial grounds. I mean, a, a village is like a, a, a much larger society, but it tends to be isolated. So you might have, you know, a village can be small, could be hundreds of families, could be a few families or whatever. But that tends to be the Vietnamese connection to the, to the world. It's their village. Um, they may have a, a market, you know, where they grow things. I'll talk about the, the economy in a minute, but they tend to kind of be part of their village. So when you talk about people's war, these people have an intimate connection to the land that they're defending. It's more than, you know, defending a home or whatever. I mean, this is more than that. It's the village where they live is, is it's their entire society. 
and your ancestors are buried there. You have your, your rice paddies there and everything else. Yeah. It sounds like you're talking about African society. Yeah, I think, you know, you see this uh, in many places where there's a real connection there because it hasn't modernized, you know, as quickly as the West has. And the West tends to be more distended, you know. Uh, you don't have suburbs in Vietnam in the 19th century or anything like that. So, the, yeah, it's, it's localized. You don't have the same type of communications and transportation. So people, you know, it's, it's ox cart. So people aren't able to take a train or... Uh, uh, you know, later on a car or a bus or whatever and kind of see the country. So there, there tends to be a, a greater sense of uh, community in that small group. Uh, and again, this is difficult when the Americans come in. One of the things they always try to do is to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese. It's one of the, the common slogans they used. Uh, but, but there was a great deal of misunderstanding on just how attached the Vietnamese were. So, I mean, one of the great failures was something called the Strategic Hamlets Program, where they were trying to move the Vietnamese out of their villages because they believed that the enemy Viet Cong was going in and proselytizing. And so what they did is take them out and they put them in new villages. Well, you know, do you want to be removed from your house and brought somewhere that you don't know about? And, and you know, when you, especially it's even worse when you have burial grounds and your rice paddies and everything else there. So I was just, I was just thinking that the land, that these, these, these peoples, you know, were wedded to the land you know, like, and especially as we talk about the natural order, mm -hmm. you know, for oh, any yeah. indigenous people, you know, that, that roots <clears throat> grow into the earth and you're a part of the earth. The earth is, you're one. You oh, are absolutely. one. There's no separation. Yeah. Absolutely. Where were the government historians <laughs> in <laughs> America? You know, with oh, a very elementary, elementary um, understanding I mean, of In 1960, uh, there were only, I think, uh, about 10 Americans who could even read or speak any Vietnamese, so no one knew anything about it. Yeah. But I mean, that's that sense of the land. I mean, there, you know, in American society, I guess, you know, small farmers in the 18th, 19th century, yeoman farmers could be compared somewhat to that. But I mean, you know, or you even see nowadays when uh, when you have farm foreclosures, I mean, there'll be farmers there and the entire community will rally around them. You know, they won't let the repo men come in. And so, you know how attached people can be. And this is this is the entire nation is, is like this land is so crucial. I mean, it's more than simply property. It's really a, a way of life. It's spiritual. Exactly. I mean, literally, it's spiritual. In fact, if a, if a soldier is killed during during the American War, if a soldier is killed, I mean, people don't believe that his body can be at rest until it's recovered and brought back to the to the home area, to the village. If not, this body just kind of goes wandering around, you know, looking for, for peace and solace. So the village is really, really important. And American, uh, when it comes to strategy, things like pacification programs or whatnot, there's really kind of a misunderstanding of this uh, when there is an attempt made to, to understand it at all. Right. The final thing, which is kind of connected to that, is subsistence economy. Um, uh, Vietnam is, of, of course, an agricultural society, and the biggest crop is, is going to be rice or rice paddies in, in the villages. Um, there may be an outdoor market with some uh, small-scale transactions. Uh, rice is the key, but there is always the specter of hunger. One never knows you know, what the rice crop is going to be like um, because you have this kind of decentralized, localized way of life. Um, you don't have larger markets, although trade does occur. You have craftsmen and artisan in villages as well, you know, uh, smiths or furniture makers or whatnot. Um, but things tend to occur within that subsistence economy. There's not, you know, you don't go down to the local Sears and Roebuck or, or anything like that, obviously. Uh, this is a, an agrarian, peasant, rural society, right? And it remains so into the 20th century. I mean, Vietnam is not heavily industrialized or anything, even when the Americans come in. It was the Americans who brought a lot of this to Vietnam. I mean, they, you know, they had to create ports and communication systems and roads and things like that. So uh, it is not a, a modern technological society. It does not have a market economy to speak of. It tends to be more subsistence, it tends to be more localized. Okay? Uh, and as I said, <laughs> those values are important when the American phase of the war begins, uh, the French and the Americans both, you're going to see these, these ideas come back time and again. This sense of, of piety, of, of, uh, of respect, of a natural order, uh, this respect for the village, uh, for uh, uh, this community, uh, this attachment to the land and so forth. So these are going to be ideas that, that really uh, remain uh, current throughout the entire period. Okay. This brings us to what you asked before, the European 
uh, connection. I mean, we've kind of have some sense of Vietnamese history up to the French period, and now we can talk uh, about the Europeans and uh, get to um, you know what eventually will become uh, the uh, liberation movements and the independence movements and the the, the uh, uh, revolutions, wars, all all at the same time. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about European colonialism in Indochina, the the confrontation with the West. Um, in the first instance, a lot of this conflict has to do with uh, two very com different societies with different sets of values. Uh, one, Confucian, the other, capitalist. And so um, there's clearly not a whole lot of middle ground here. Uh, when the West begins to get interested in Vietnam, it is on a path toward capitalist empire. The Vietnamese are Confucian. Okay. By the 19th century, by the 1800s, Western civilization was on this path toward capitalist empire. It was compelling the rest of the world to participate in an ever-growing international market economy. Okay, there have, the, the market economy grows out of Europe from the 15th century onward, and increasingly the Europeans begin to look into what today we call the third world, the underdeveloped world. Uh, for markets, especially for raw materials, for resources, for cheap labor. You know, I mean, it, to the, the utter extreme of, of taking slaves out of Africa, you know, in, in, in South America and, of course, in North America. So the, the underdeveloped parts of the world are really crucial to this expanding, this growing market economy on a global scale. We talk about globalization. That's a real buzzword today if you follow the news or read the literature. And globalization at the end of the 20th century is really nowhere near what globalization was like in the 19th century, which was an incredibly uh, frenzied atmosphere of, of markets and colonialism and acquisition and so forth. Uh, the biggest difference is that in the, the 19th century it was done with armies. In the 20th century it's done with banks. You know, it's, there's, a, there's a real shift in the way it's done. It's every bit as, as effective and can be every bit as nefarious, but it's done uh, with less bloodshed and, you know, kind of more efficiency. Uh, but uh, you start to see this real movement uh, in, the, in the 19th century toward this capitalist economy, this market economy. And the major powers, uh, the, the great countries, the French and the, the Russians, the Germans, the British, Spain and Portugal to some extent, uh, the Americans later in the, in the 19th century, uh, are in competition for markets, for raw materials, uh, for labor, cheap labor. And they often resort to force of arms, to the military to use this. The British do this in India and in uh, Hong Kong as a result of the, the uh, infamous opium wars where they force the Chinese <coughs> to buy opium and then they seize Hong Kong. They do it in Egypt. Uh, the Dutch do this in what is today Indonesia, the Dutch East Indies. Uh, the Spanish had done it in the Philippines before that. Uh, in fact, everybody's kind of trying to race into China. China is kind of decaying in the, in the 1800s. So, you know, by the end of the century, you start to see various countries, the Russians at Port Arthur and the Germans at Qingdao, uh, take, take pieces of China. So there's this kind of Western frenzy. And the Americans, of course, do it in Hawaii, in the Philippines, uh, uh, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and, and, and elsewhere. So Vietnam is going to be <coughs> uh, a part of this process as well. Um, the Vietnamese, they're Confucian. They have a different sense of the natural order than the West does. I mean, to the West, the natural order is this expansion. It's this growth. Western and Eastern societies often have terribly different values. Uh, the West sees property as something to be used and, and exploited for growth and expansion, unlike the East. I mean, this, this idea of uh, the yeoman farmer by the 19th century is giving way to kind of a more commercial agricultural ethic, whereas in Vietnam you don't see that. So again, it's capitalism versus Confucianism. The Vietnamese have a different sense of the natural order. They want to avoid this new world system. They're not real thrilled about globalization. They don't believe that it will work to their benefit. And every, uh, every time there is a shift in the way business is done in, in either a world system or on a local level, some people are going to benefit from it, and many aren't. There's never, ever been any kind of a system developed where everybody benefited from it. And so what the Vietnamese would say is you have to determine the eff efficacy, the, 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 the decency of a system by who wins and who loses. 
And as the Vietnamese see it, in this international market economy, they and the dark-skinned peoples of the world and the, the underdeveloped peoples of the world probably won't win. Globalization will work to the benefit of particular elites, but they'll probably be European. So the Vietnamese, this offends them on a practical level, but in addition to that, um, it offends them uh, in terms of their, their own, I mean, they wouldn't have said it this way, but their class interests, their, their economic interests are at stake as well. So this globalization is uh, very difficult. Uh, the Europeans, however, you know, are looking for opportunities everywhere, and traders begin to take an interest in Vietnam. And the first attempt is by the Portuguese, and they established a settlement uh, near the coast at Da Nang. Uh, da Nang is in the kind of the central area right along the coast of the South China Sea. Um, and the Portuguese established a settlement there in 1535. Uh, and this is really the first attempt. Now, the um, Portuguese uh, wanted to use Vietnam, like Marco Polo had, to get into the uh, spice trades of Asia. Uh, they spent about a century in Vietnam until the mid-17th century before leaving, and the Portuguese leave, and of course their, their goals were never met, but other Europeans were, were uh, uh, looking uh, to Vietnam at the same time, and especially the French. Okay? Um, and the French arrive in 15, I'm sorry, 1858. Uh, the French, and actually a few Spanish ships were involved in this too. There was a fleet of 14 ships, mostly French, a few Spanish, with about 3,000 troops um, seized Da Nang in 1858. And let's take a break and we'll pick it up after this.